Dinosaur King is a media franchise created and owned by Sega where dinosaurs transform to and from cards and can be summoned by people to do battle with one another. There's an arcade game, a DS game, a two season anime and trading card game or TCG. Dinosaurs are categorised into one of seven elements, lightning, earth, grass, wind, fire, water, or secret. In this series, I'll be going through and analysing the scientific accuracy of the species within each element. In this video, we're going to be looking at the fire element, home to the broad category of large theropods, and is one of four elements in the franchise the group is split across, in addition to water, wind and secret. Fire does at least contain two definitive families that are exclusive to it, the Tyrannosaurids and Carcharodontosaurids, along with members of groups also in the wind and secret elements. Fire move cards almost always consist of the dinosaur opening its mouth and breathing fire like a dragon to engulf opponents in flames. In Dinosaur King, all the theropods have a fair few universal issues that are very common errors. The first are that many are shrink-wrapped, with the fenestrae, the holes in the skull, being present through the skin when they should be obscured by skin and tissue. Theropods are also thought by most researchers to have had lips. However, here most of them have exposed teeth. They all have pronated wrists, when their palms would have been facing each other rather than the ground. They're restored with the correct number of toes with four, however their middle toes are shown as being the same length as the other two weight-bearing toes, but it should be longer as it bore the most weight. The final note is that many of their tails are too skinny. Theropods had large chordofemoral muscles, the muscles that were anchored to the tail that would pull the legs back, and so they should be much thicker at the bases. Since the taxonomic groups included in fire are particularly eclectic, I'm just going to start out with members of groups also in other elements and end with the two families unique to the fire element. Without further ado, the first fire dinosaur we're going to be looking at is Abelosaurus. It lived in Argentina during the late Cretaceous, roughly 80 million years ago. Its name means Abel's lizard, after its discoverer, Roberto Abel. It is the type genus of the family Abelosauridae, the majority of the members in Dinosaur King being placed in the wind element, except for this genus and one other. It's only known from a single partial skull, making the animal's overall size difficult to determine. It has consistently been estimated as similar in size to other South American abelosaurs, such as Carnotaurus. Speaking of, what I find so strange about that is that Carnotaurus is typically restored at around 8 meters long, larger than Abelosaurus at roughly 6 meters long, yet it is in the wind element. It's very odd. As for the model itself, the head looks perfectly reconstructed based on the only known material. The rest of the body is reconstructed based on more complete Abelosaur genera. As such, it has the error of having the standard arm posture for theropods, but those of Abelosaurs pointed backwards. It does have the correct number of fingers with four though, and unless I'm mistaken, the fourth finger may even correctly be lacking a claw, which would be amazing, but I cannot find a decent picture to save my life. Considering only parts of the skull are known, and it's reproduced perfectly here, and the body proportions look correct to me, I'd say this model is really good. The other fire ablosaur is Rajasaurus. Its name means King Lizard, and it lived in India at the end of the Cretaceous, around 66 million years ago. It was once thought to be around 11 meters long, making it the largest ablosaurid and a prime candidate for the fire element. However, later studies reconstruct it as much smaller at closer to 6 meters. The head looks very close to the skull material, with the signature small horn on top of the head. However, the snout seems slightly too long and sloping, when the tip should be blunter. The body doesn't really look like that of an ablosaur. The group's signature arms are far too long and only have three fingers when they should have four, and point backwards. The torso is also too short, and the legs seem too long and bulky. Overall, it's not the best Rajasaurus. Next we have Torvosaurus, the only fire megalosaur. 
Its name means savage lizard, and it lived in North America, Europe, and possibly also Africa during the late Jurassic, roughly 150 million years ago. If any megalosaur should be placed in the fire element, I agree it should be this one, as it was one of, if not the, largest theropod of the entire Jurassic period, and is the largest ever found in Europe. Depending on the species, it ranged from 9 to 11 meters long. This model appears to represent the North American species T. tanneri based on the number of teeth, which makes sense as it was the only species known at the time. Megalosaurid heads are now known to be slightly longer and more rectangular in profile, compared to the more triangular shape here. The number of fingers is correct with three. The torso should probably be a bit longer, and the legs should probably be a bit shorter. It seems to be built more like a tyrannosaur than a megalosaur, but it's not bad. I also just have to mention how cool that lava style colour scheme is, it is just awesome. Next we have what seems to be a fan favourite, the somewhat controversial genus Sorophagonax. Its name means Lord of Lizard Eaters, and it lived in North America during the late Jurassic, roughly 150 million years ago. At around 10 meters long, several researchers find it to be a very large species of the similar genus Allosaurus, as a Maximus, whereas several others find it distinct enough to refer it to its own genus. The reason it's so difficult to determine is because it is only known from fragmentary remains, and Allosaurus is extremely common in the same dig sites and can show a lot of individual variation. As such, this model is very similar to the Allosaurus model in the wind element, as it should be. Whilst a complete skull isn't known for Sorophagonax, it feels very reasonable to give it the two crests just in front of the eyes like those of Allosaurus. It has the correct number of fingers with three, and the body is also essentially a more heavily built Allosaurus. It is interesting how despite sharing practically the exact same build, it being larger warrants Sorophagonax to be in the fire element, whereas the roughly 8 meter long Allosaurus is in the wind element. The biggest issue is that it's said to be 15 meters long, far larger than most estimates I've seen. Otherwise though, it is wonderful, whether it's Sorophagonax or Allosaurus Maximus. Up next we have Yangchuanosaurus. It is a member of another family also included in the wind element, the Metriacanthosaurids. Its name means Yongchuan Lizard, after the district in China near to where it was discovered in rock data to the late Jurassic, roughly 160 million years ago. If you saw my video on the wind element, you may remember I assumed Szechuanosaurus represented the animal now referred to as Yangchuanosaurus zigongensis. I believe this model represents the type species, Y. shanguensis. Size estimates vary for this species, from as short as 8 meters to as long as 11 meters. What I wasn't expecting was for the model referred to as Szechuanosaurus to be a better representation of this genus than the model actually labeled Yangchuanosaurus. The head looks to be too long and sloping too gently. Why Shanguensis actually had a really blunt snout and quite a round skull, reminiscent of an Abelosaur. This ends up looking more like Allosaurus. The crests appear to start too far up the snout, when they should extend from the tip of the snout up to just in front of the eyes. The legs may be slightly too long as well, but it does at least have the correct number of fingers with three. On the whole, it's not the best Yangchuanosaurus, but it's not bad. Next we have the namesake genus for the Metriacanthosaurids, Metriacanthosaurus. It lived in England during the late Jurassic around 160 million years ago. Its name means moderately spined lizard, as it was thought to have had spines on its vertebrae taller than most theropods known at the time. However, more discoveries showed they were actually not that much taller than most theropods. As such, the spinal ridge this model has may not be accurate. It is only known from an incomplete skeleton, and the skull is unknown. Here it has been given a pair of crests over the eyes, similar to Allosaurus. These are of course speculative, but considering its more complete relatives, such as young Chuanosaurus, had head crests, I'd say it's reasonable to assume Metriacanthosaurus had them too. It does have the correct number of fingers with three. 
What's odd is that it's estimated to be around the same size as its relative Synraptor, if not smaller, even though that genus is in the wind element. I really don't know what the judgement call is for what counts as a large theropod. It's hard to judge the accuracy of this model due to the animal only being known from incomplete skeletal material. What is there though, such as the spinal ridge, is sadly outdated now. This brings us to the two families exclusive to the fire element. First up, we have the Carcharodontosaurids. Several of the largest theropods ever discovered are within this group, so I'd say they are prime candidates for the fire element. The Dinosaur King models are all from the Cretaceous, as are almost all members of the family. They all have the correct number of fingers with three. Their bodily proportions are a bit off though. Their heads all seem to be too big in comparison to their bodies, their torsos also seem to be too short, and their arms seem to be too long, with one exception, which we'll get to. The first genus we're going to be looking at is Giganotosaurus. Its name means giant southern lizard, and it lived in Argentina during the late Cretaceous, roughly 99 million years ago. When it comes to accuracy, it's an odd case with Giganotosaurus, as the Dinosaur King model may have secondarily become accurate by complete accident. Older reconstructions had a much longer skull that sloped quite gently towards the tip of the snout, with the back of the upper tooth row appearing quite jagged for some reason. More recent reconstructions shorten the skull and give it a straighter upper tooth row. This model seems to have a mix of these two portrayals. Because it's shrink-wrapped, the underlying skull's fenestre seem to represent the old portrayal, but the snout looks too short. It might be because it's not a great portrayal of the older skull reconstruction, but it ends up looking more like the more modern version, probably by complete accident. It's hard to judge the accuracy of this Giganotosaurus, but I'm inclined to say it's not great, as it wasn't amazing at the time, and it isn't now either. Next we have Mapusaurus. Its name means Earth Lizard, and it lived in Argentina during the late Cretaceous, roughly 95 million years ago. Unlike the Giganotosaurus, the Mapusaurus' head looks to be spot on to reconstruction of the skull from its original description in 2006. By modern standards, however, the skull is far too long and pointed. The snout should be much more blunt, and the head as a whole should be more rectangular in profile. So on the whole, it's pretty good for the time, but is also now outdated. Up next we have the family's namesake, Carcharodontosaurus. Its name means shark tooth lizard, and it lived in Africa during the late Cretaceous, roughly 95 million years ago. I'm confident this model represents the type species C. saharicus. For the time, this model is pretty good, aside from the general family issues of course. However, it is now slightly outdated. The front part of the skull, the premaxilla, is unknown for this genus, and so it was estimated based on other theropod skulls. However, more complete Carcharodontosaurid skulls have shown that we were most likely reconstructing the tip of its snout as too long and pointed. It's also possible the blunter snout is also incorrect. It's just impossible to say unless we find a premaxilla for this animal specifically. Sadly, many of the post-cranial remains of this animal were unfortunately destroyed during Allied bombings of Germany in World War II, where the fossil material was on display in a museum. As such, the best alternative is to use more completely known relatives to fill in the gaps. Since the others have weird proportions in Dinosaur King, so too does the Carcharodontosaurus, sadly. On the whole though, this is a decent model. The next genus is Eocarcaria. Its name means Dawn Shark, and it lived in Niger during the early Cretaceous, roughly 115 million years ago. It is only known from skull fragments, and so this model is mostly speculative and based on more complete relatives. It looks to be heavily based on the Carcharodontosaurus model, which I suppose makes sense as they're both from Africa. As such, it most likely shares its issues of the head being too pointed and triangular in profile. It does, however, correctly portray the top of its head with the distinct and robust crests over the eyes. 
It is next to impossible to judge the accuracy of this genus, though, due to Eocarcaria just being too incompletely known. The last Carcharodontosaurid is Acrocanthosaurus. Whilst argued by some to not even be a Carcharodontosaurid, most studies do include it in the group, so I'll do the same for this video. It lived in North America during the early Cretaceous, roughly 110 million years ago. Its name means high-spined lizard, after the tall neural spines on its vertebrae. This has been interpreted as a tall spine running the length of its back, similar to that of Spinosaurus, as is seen here. However, more modern reconstructions suggest the spine supported a muscular hump or ridge instead. As for the head, the shape looks to be a perfect match to the skull. Unlike the other models, the torso looks to be correct, as does the length of the arms. I'd say this is the best Carcharodontosaurid model, despite the cool spinal ridge not being as well supported now. The other group exclusive to the fire element are the Tyrannosaurids. I don't think I need to explain why this family, whose members are all the undisputed apex predators in every ecosystem they've been found in across North America and Asia, are in the large theropod element. This group lived at the end of the Cretaceous from 83 to 66 million years ago, and had only two fingers, which are correctly shown in the Dinosaur King models. With that said, the arms are still reconstructed as too long, unfortunately. Something else all the Tyrannosaur models have in common is that they're really, really good. The first Tyrannosaurid we'll be looking at is Albertosaurus. Its name means Alberta Lizard, after the Canadian province where it was discovered in rock dated to roughly 70 million years ago. The head looks spot on to the skull material, with the small horns just in front of the eyes. The body proportions look pretty much perfect. I suppose the legs could be ever so slightly longer, but other than that, it is wonderful. Next we have Gorgosaurus. Its name means Dreadful Lizard, and it lived in North America roughly 75 million years ago. It was closely related to Albertosaurus, so much so that some researchers consider it to be a species of Albertosaurus, a Libratus. However, most studies have found it to be distinct. Its head also looks spot on to the skull material with the small horns just in front of the eyes. The body proportions look superb, and I have nothing more to say other than it too is excellent. Next we have Daspletosaurus. Its name means Frightful Lizard, and it lived in North America from 78 to 74 million years ago. It is heavily debated how many species are within the genus Daspletosaurus, with some arguing there are three and others saying there is only one. At the time, the only species known was the type species, D. Terosus, and as far as I can tell, this model does seem to be based on the Canadian material referred to this species. It has the distinct ridges on the snout leading up to the crest in front of the eyes, as well as the distinct bumpy ridge on the midline of the snout. As far as I can tell, the proportions seem perfect for this model too. Another home run! Next we have the most famous dinosaur of all, and the family's namesake genus, Tyrannosaurus, aka Terry and Gygus from the anime. Its name means Tyrant Lizard. Tyrannosaurus was long considered a monospecific genus, with the only species of course being T. rex. Other specimens suggested to be lumped into the genus include Tarbosaurus, who we'll talk about in a bit, as Tyrannosaurus batar, and the headache-inducing Nanotyrannus, which may or may not represent a juvenile Tyrannosaurus. Then, in January of 2024, a second species was named based on distinct skeletal material, T. macraensis. This species lived roughly 73 million years ago, roughly 5 to 7 million years older than T. rex. As you can imagine, this all makes it quite difficult to say when and where Tyrannosaurus lived exactly. With that said, all material definitively referred to Tyrannosaurus has been found in North America in rock dating from 73 to 66 million years ago. Putting all that aside, given the time frame in which the Dinosaur King model was made in the 2000s, Terry is more than likely based on material still referred to T. rex. 
As such, the only issue I can see is that in modern reconstructions, the top of the snout slopes more smoothly from the top of the head to the end of the snout, and that the ridges over the eyes are too tall when they should be flat and extend further down the snout. Otherwise though, Terry is a great portrayal of T-Rex for the time, and still holds up pretty well today too. Next we have Tarbosaurus. Its name means alarming lizard, and it lived in Asia roughly 70 million years ago. Like I said earlier, some researchers consider it an Asian species of Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaurus batar. However, most studies find it to be distinct, particularly in the features of the skull. The biggest being that it was much narrower than that of T-Rex, which is reflected in the model. Despite that, I'm inclined to say this is the weakest Tyrannosaur model, as it doesn't really look that much like Tarbosaurus. The crests are in the wrong positions and the wrong shape, as they're far too tall. Tarbosaurus actually had two ridges on its head, one slightly in front of its eyes and one slightly above and proceeding past and slightly encircling the eyes. The back of the head should also be slightly taller, as is the case with all of the Tyrannosaurs though, the bodily proportions are pretty spot on. I think it speaks volumes about how good Dinosaur King's Tyrannosaur models are, that the Tarbosaurus is the weakest one, and it's still pretty good. The last Tyrannosaurid is Alioremus. It also lived in Asia roughly 70 million years ago, and its name means different branch, referring to how it was thought to be in a different lineage to most Tyrannosaur genera. This is still thought to be true, as it is placed within a tribe of long-snouted Tyrannosaurs, the Alioremini. Whilst two species are known, this model most likely represents the type species, a Remotus, as it was the only one known at the time. This species is only known from a single, incomplete skull, but the known material is perfectly reconstructed here. It has the long, narrow snout with the bumpy ridge on the top and small crest just in front of the eyes. This model may be slightly outdated now, as the discovery of the second, much more complete species, a Altai, showed that this animal had a very gracile build. As such, this model may be too heavily built now, but for the time, it is excellent. The final fire dinosaur is an enigmatic genus, Siamotyrannus. Its name means Siamese tyrant, as it was discovered in Thailand in rock dated to the early Cretaceous, roughly 133 million years ago. It is very fragmentary, only known from a single specimen consisting of some hip and tail bones. As its name suggests, it was first thought to be a Tyrannosaurid, however its classification has shifted several times since its description in 1996. It is reconstructed here as a Tyrannosaurid, however due to it being so fragmentary, it is next to impossible to critically evaluate the accuracy of this model, unless we find more skeletal material for this genus, but considering how much older it is geologically than all known Tyrannosaurids, this reconstruction feels very doubtful. Dinosaur King's fire element is quite strongly demarcated in terms of its accuracy, as depending on the group, it ranges from decent to excellent. The Tyrannosaurs are among the best models in the entire franchise, they are genuinely fantastic. The others though are quite a mixed bag. The Cocharodontosaurs are sadly a bit dated now, but even for the time, the proportions are kind of funky. The other species, ignoring the eclectic lineup, are also very variable, making it hard to judge how well the element as a whole holds up in terms of accuracy, which makes me wonder, what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. I'd like to thank my good friend The Cobra Effect, and recommend you check out my friend and fellow Paleo YouTuber, The Casual Prince 8, and his videos on Dinosaur King if you're a fan. Thank you guys so much for watching, and please do check out my other videos and subscribe, as it helps a ton. Bye bye now.